think we can proceed uh, given that we're a little bit behind right to the floor if there's any questions from the floor. Jeff Livesey in the back and Tom Oliver. <coughs> Thanks very much. I always hate people who get up and say, well, you know, I did a study of this, but I'm going to do that. It's uh, <laughs> very superb, Gabrielli. Um, when we're thinking about, you know, the fermentability of cereal fiber, and I imagine, and it was wheat, you know, it's really not very fermentable. That would be number one. And number two, the colonic environment is a very complex ecosystem. In fact, there's about three or four ecosystems, and it would take a very long time to change. And, and we've kind of done a study, as they looking at uh, short-chain fatty acid responses in blood after feeding people wheat, you know, all-brand cereal for a year, and it took, you know, nine to 12 months for you to begin to see changes, and that's about in line with what I understand animal studies show, uh, months and months it takes to really begin to reach an equilibrium as to what's happening when you disturb an extremely complex ecosystem like that, and I just wonder, uh, maybe we could, or what you thought about that, or whatever. Yeah, that's a very relevant question. We also asked ourselves the, 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 this question. There are different possible uh, explanations. Of course, none of them is really exhaustive. Uh, first of all, there was also some uh, rye. We, we did not utilize exclusively uh, wheat, so there was in part rye, and rye uh, fibers are more fermentable. The second possibility is that a relevant part of the wheat that we utilized was in the form of pasta, which is made with durum wheat. And once again, fermentability of fibers from durum wheat is different from that of soft wheat. In a, just to, to explain you how much this can be important in also in explaining the, 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 the effect of, of all grain. In a previous study, we, we uh, have checked the, the impact of all grain uh, uh, durum wheat present in pasta on plasma lipoproteins. And we could see a significant effect on LDL cholesterol. In this study, we did not observe any effect on, on cholesterol because the amount of durum wheat was reduced because there was a relevant part also. Uh, in form of uh, uh, bread, and which is made with soft wheat. So uh, uh, what you say is important. That, that underlined the need to perform studies like this in the long term. You did nine months. Probably even nine months could not be sufficient to, to, to see the full uh, e expression of the benefits of all grain. This also can be the reason why intervention trials are so uh, elusive in, in, in respect to observational study where the evidence is very old. Yeah, so I, my, I guess my thrust was let's not write off wheat bran as a, or even cereal fiber as a biologically active material, which I think is what you're saying. May I, may I add, uh, add a comment on this? So we, sometimes we, we underlook the effect of polyphenols into the colon since they are transformed. So even if you don't change the microflora, microbiota, which remains more or less the same, there are many bacterial activities which can break down some polyphenols which are no, not absorbed. They go straight to the colon. And they, for example, they produce a, a series of metabolites such as valerolactans which are further uh, conjugated into the, into the liver and they have biological targets. So, it's also possible that the effect of, of fibers, which are also rich in polyphenols, such as the, the, the cereal grain fibers, which are, no, could act through this way, not just change, by changing the microbiota, but by providing uh, in, um, substrate for further fermentation to produce um, metabolites. Yeah, uh, quite in addition to that, I want to, um, we published a paper last year um, showing that um, there was a linear relationship between the polyphenol content of Canadian potatoes and the postprandial blood glucose response. In fact, the GI of the purple flesh potato was about 70, whereas the white it was about the close it was 88. Uh, yeah. And so when we and we also we actually extracted the polyphenol and showed that there was alpha glucosidase in it. In yeah. Yeah, but that would be something different because you're talking about an acute effect. Yes. So we were talking about a, a long-term effect after a prolonged feeding of, of and, polyphenols. And then the, the other issue of, the, um, of, of um, group, um, looking at the microbiota, we, we did a, a clinical trial for in healthy persons, healthy 
Canadians um, living in the community. Um, we fed the volunteers uh, 15 milligrams, 15 grams of, of fructan, mm -hmm. fructan oligosaccharide for 28 days, a crossover study design. We found no effect on no effect on the gut microbiota. It took about two years to analyze that the microbiota, but we found no effect. <laughs> Okay, I think uh, we'll go to Jeff and Andreas and then David. So, Jeff? Jeff Lewis, the Independent Nutrition Logic. I'd just like to ask a few questions, or mainly one question, about confounding amongst these studies. And, and it's really addressed to Ricardo and, and I think uh, Jenny. Um, what we know about uh, the whole grains is that they could potentially be confounding from uh, the minerals, particularly magnesium, from the fiber. And from the from the glycemic index, so I'm wondering to what extent we know that whole grains are not showing much effect at all, independent of those three factors. And the way I look at this from from Jenny's uh, is that we know that the the relationship between the glycemic index uh, and uh, minerals and vitamins is 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 quite good there. So we have the question now of whether. Um, there's any possibility that the glycemic index is having no effect at all uh, and that it's all due to the minerals uh, and vitamins? Uh, it, it is very easy to, to answer the first question in relation to the, uh, the, the possibility that the glycemic index represents the confounder of the effect of, of grain because as a matter of fact, as you have seen also in our data, uh, consuming all grain at least in, 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 in uh, utilizing the foods that we have utilized, which is bread and pasta and crackers, did not affect the glycemic index, did not change the postprandial glucose levels. So what we have observed is independent by any effect on, on glucose. In relation to the possibility that uh, all grain effect, beneficial effect, are due to a number of factors which are present in the, uh, in the kernel, in the, in particularly in the brand, I mean, I will not consider that uh, a confounding. I, I will consider that one of the possible mechanisms of, of the beneficial effect. I, I'm not saying that uh, all grain is good for health for something which is uh, independent by its constituent. It is good for health because all grain is an important source of fiber, it's an important source of antioxidant, particularly ferulic acid and other, uh, other polyphenols. It's a good source of, of fatty acids, which are polyunsaturated fat and protein and so on and so forth. We, we, can, we consider as the most important mechanism of these benefits in relation to postprandial glucose metabolism, the amount of dietary fiber and the amount of polyphenols, but we, we, we want to stress the, the important concept that the quality of carbohydrate in the form of all grain comes from the, the, the uh, overall constituent which are present in the, in the, in the all grain product. Jenny. Um, can I just say something too? I, th I think maybe Gabrielle is, is misinterpreting your question. I think, in the, in the observational studies um, that show a, a relative risk reduction associated with increasing <coughs> whole grain intake, is that possibly confounded, that there is residual confounding, even though they've adjusted for you know, alcohol intake and exercise and um, age and family history and all that? And my answer to that is yes, I think it's pr profoundly influenced by residual confounding, more so than any other food group. And I say that because only certain people eat whole grains. They're usually health conscious, and they represent only about one in five people. And we've been saying for 50 years, eat more whole grains. And I'm afraid for 80% of the population, their eyes glaze over. So for me, telling people to eat more whole grains is actually putting a lot of people off eating a healthy diet. And that's one of the reasons why I say a low GI diet is a shortcut to a healthy diet, because you don't actually have to talk whole grains or brown rice or brown bread or brown pasta, because I think that puts a lot of people off. Okay. Yeah, but on the other hand, you have to, to consider that, for instance, if you take bread, 
and you take all grain bread, that does not mean that this all grain bread, at least the, the type of bread that you can usually get in the supermarket, that does not a low glycemic index. But still, I think that's something which should be advised to the general population because it's an important source of all these uh, micronutrients and other constituents which can be beneficial for us. So I think it, uh, although it is useful to have simple markers of good carbohydrates, if we oversimplify, I think, wanted to consider good carbohydrates on the basis of a single parameter, we not necessarily can give the people the, the right advice because we can neglect some other aspect which are relevant for giving the right advice. So we, I, I propose to have a more global approach, which you, obviously is based on the glycemic in the concept, but on other information that I think would also be relevant. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Andreas, please. Thanks, Andreas Pfeiffer from Berlin. Uh, I have one comment and one question to uh, Gabriele. Um, the comment is actually if you give uh, cellulose and hemocellulose to people, you will get very nice effects on, on, uh, on glycemia, on uh, the uh, insulin sensitivity, not on insulin secretion, and that has been shown in 1984 in papers and over the time as a very nicely heard. But most of this was due in whole grains, 70% non-soluble, non-fermentable fiber in the bran, and this has a significant effect. I realize that fermentation is a beautiful story, which has many ramifications to biochemistry and receptors and GPRs and so on, but uh, it's probably not the really relevant thing as the fruit fiber story shows. And that's something um, I think we may have to pay more attention to. And the question to Gabriel is, we actually increased whole fiber intake by 10 grams. And if you think about dose responses, that's probably too little. And wouldn't that explain? You know you have this right effect, which fits exactly, but it's, it's just too small. And I would think it's a question of dose, wouldn't you? Yes, yeah, certainly it's a matter of dose. But I can tell you that it was not easy to increase these 10 grams of fiber exclusively from all grain. We, we have uh, performed other studies. We, we have, some of them have been mentioned also by him, uh, 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 in which we were able to increase the amount of dietary fiber as much as 30 grams per day. But in this case, you can combine all grain with vegetable and fruit. In this case, we wanted to select specifically all grain, so we had to keep constant all vegetable and fruit consumption. And we, we gave an incredible amount of uh, uh, bread and pasta to, to, to these people. Luckily, they did not put on weight, but the amount that were, they were consuming every day was really relevant. But, uh, I mean, if you combine the rest of uh, uh, fiber-rich foods, certainly you can uh, achieve much more uh, uh, significant increase in dietary fiber. Yeah, I agree on that. The argument of Denise was you need supplementation, and I think that's a good argument. Yeah. <coughs> okay. David, you're next, please. Thank you. It's again for Gabriele. Um, I was glad Jenny made her comments. I want to declare a conflict of interest immediately. Uh, two of my mentors were Dennis Burkett and Hugh Trowell. They were great men and uh, taught me a great deal personally. So it's not with any reluctance. It is great with, with rather with great reluctance that I worry about wheat bran and whole wheat, which was, of course, part of their message. Uh, we've worked tirelessly. We've, we've given 20 grams to, to diabetics and followed them for three months and looked for absolutely everything we could measure in the blood. Didn't look at the colon, it's true. But everything we could measure in the blood and nothing changed by comparison with the low-fiber diet. Worrying. Um, right at the early stages, we got people at, at Central Middlesex Hospital um, with torrential diarrhea from high-fiber intakes, high-cereal fiber intakes, looking desperately hard to see if we could find anything that wasn't in the pot. We found a lot in the pot, and John Cummings made a great name for himself out of a lot of very good colonic function work. Um, but we found nothing, and yet all the time one sees cereal fiber and whole grains inevitably coming out as being protective for heart disease and cardiovascular disease in cohort studies. Is there nothing that we can measure that isn't postprandial or in the colon that is a standard risk factor for diabetes and cardiovascular disease that we can measure to see changing 
are we looking at the wrong groups? We've looked at the healthy, we've looked at the semi-healthy, we've looked at the unhealthy, and we can't get changes. I'm just worried about this, really worried. Jerry, you, we, uh, uh, sorry, David, we, we, <clears throat> we must have clear that the, the only message that we can give to the general population is that they should get the right type of carbohydrate foods, a combination of fruit, vegetables or grain. If you try to dissect this message, which is the only relevant message which comes out from observational study and from intervention study, putting all them together, and you want to dissect the message to understand what makes the difference, what is the mechanism, then you get troubles. You get troubles if you want to isolate dietary fiber. You get trouble if you want to isolate all grain. But you get trouble if you want to isolate fruit and vegetable. If you look at the studies in which you change the amount of fruit and vegetables in the people, you don't get any result. Even observational studies are misleading, much more misleading than uh, all grain. And obviously, uh, uh, as Jenny was, was saying, people eating fruit and vegetables are the part of the population is more sensitive to the healthy message. If you look at the relationship between specific fruit and vegetables and the risk of type 2 diabetes or the risk of, 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 of cardiovascular disease, the results are much weaker than for all grain. So I, I believe that something must be in the all grain. Maybe that all grain benefits are not only Specifically linked to wheat, okay. Other cereals also may be important. Maybe that the, the, the observation, the time of observation intervention studies too short. We need three months are nothing in the natural history of people who need to change their microbiota, their ability to ferment dietary fiber. Probably even one year is too short. And we have not the possibility to go into that. But I would exclude that your personal experience as well as my personal experience, will dismiss the importance of advising people all grain as a, a relevant uh, way of improving their health, at least on the basis of the observational uh, study. On that, I agree perfectly. And th they should be of long duration, not even three months or six months, but years. Uh, Fred is next, and then one more question after that. Yeah, Fred Browns, Masters University. Uh, there was one point on those, uh, maybe the 10 grams is not enough. There is just a very nice meta-analysis out from Giao in the International Journal of Food Science, looking at fiber and C-reactive protein. And the one of the conclusions was that you need at least a difference of 8 grams in the treatment groups to show any effect. So those plays a role. Uh, there has been discussion on reducing glycemic effects and, and reducing the rate of digestion and absorption. Uh, we were aware of the green bananas that are fed in developing countries to reduce the incidence of diarrhea because green bananas are full of resistant starch and also contain a lot of fructans. Uh, now, that brought us to an, another ID. Green bananas are unripe. And we felt that uh, if, the, if the, the cookbook says that you must cook the potatoes 15 minutes, cook them 12 minutes. If it said that the rice should be cooked 10 minutes, cook, cook it 8 minutes. And the pasta, if it is 15 minutes, cook it 12 minutes. <laughs> By doing that, you have less ripe potatoes or less ripe star, uh, uh, pasta to eat, but you increase significantly the amount of starch that will pass onto the colon, and you reduce glycemia. And I would like to know what you think of this and whether that might be an idea to, uh, to address in the study. Oh, that would be. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Why me? <laughs> well, that would be interesting to. Now, also to note that the. I, I didn't ever see any, any study which controlled by, by the, the rate of eating, so the fast eaters. Now, compared to the, you know, to the people who sit and 
chew many, many times the same food. That could be something to control for. Um, and the fact that simple cooking procedures that can affect the glycemic response, for example, but not only that, also the, 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 the amount of indigestible starch can be applied commonly. Yes, that's, that's correct. I did not show you, but even by choosing the, the right dress for the pasta, apart cooking it two or three minutes less, uh, will change dramatically the, the glycemic response of pasta, which is already a low glycemic food, a low glycemic index food. So it's something that can be done. So the, the application of, of cooking procedures and trying to yeah. pass also this message. Yeah. Can I just say something? In the interests of people who enjoy fine food, I wouldn't muck around with the, the timing of food. I think think pasta and rice and potatoes are cooked for a certain period of time because people have worked out that that's the way you enjoy it best. Yes. And enjoyment should come first. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's, that's awesome. Okay. Uh, final question, please. It's Marianne Ha. Huh? Uh, one's a comment. Uh, Gabrielli, I noticed you said that lignin, um, bran contains lignin. It doesn't. Um, this work I did in my last incarnation. Um, it is actually full of cutins and waxes. There is actually no lignin present. It's um, an old paper that we did. The other thing is a comment uh, following from David Jenkins. Are we perhaps looking at fibre in the wrong way? Are, should we be looking at it in terms of plant structure, and plant cell wall? Um, and my challenge, which um, has come from the work I did in plant cell walls, um, some fibres are actually <coughs> digested in the small intestine, so they're not absorbed, but there is the start of the breakdown. Now, when you actually look at the way you extract um, plant cell wall components using plant cell wall techniques, which is uh, something that Anglist adapted. Um, what actually happens is you acidify and neutralize um, the walls, and the pectins and other soluble, well, vis viscous fiber components start to change in nature. And, they, and that's how you actually start to extract the wall. Um, so I am suggesting that through our digestive processes, as soon as food leaves the stomach and is neutralised, we are starting to actually change the nature of our fibre. And that digestive process actually influences what can and can't be absorbed readily in the small intestine. Andrew, Andrew would you like to uh, try to respond to that one? It sounds good. <laughs> Can I just mention that um, Annette Buchan did a uh, systematic review of fiber, high fiber and whole grain diets versus low glycemic index diets, low glycemic index diets, and their effect on inflammatory markers in the blood. And the low GI diets were more consistently associated with lower levels of, say, CRP and other inflammatory factors than were the randomized controlled trials comparing high fiber or whole grain.